so yeah, uh, welcome to uh, the talk with the worst title ever, because even not I can remember it. Um, well, hi, I'm Sebastian. I'm from Cologne, Germany, and um, I'm going to talk about a bunch of stuff that relate to web video or video on the web. But I actually do not work with video on the web on my day-to-day uh, -day job because um, I'm usually working in the field of consumer IoT, a smart home, etc. So I'm, I'm really glad that I do not have to talk about this topic after Luke's talk this morning, which was fantastic. And yeah, um, if you have any questions, I'm around all day, of course. But if you don't want to like approach me directly, you can reach me on Twitter uh, via the handle Ask you Disco or write me even a mail if you don't use Twitter using public at askedisco.com. So, yeah, you might have seen this title site with all these weird letters, acronyms, abbreviations, and I know that does not seem to make much sense, right? So, that was the same for me when, when I started digging down that rabbit hole called video on the web. And I'd say, don't worry, I think after the next 25 minutes, those abbreviations and acronyms won't seem as alien as they did just now to you anymore, at least I hope. But um, before we're going to talk about those acronyms, let's do a quick tour of the history of video on the web, or as I call it, like from QuickTime to Netflix in just 25 years. So, um, Apple invented QuickTime in 1990, so it wasn't used on the web back then, but not until 93, I believe. But that's where it all started. I mean, it was an amazing technology back in the day. Like in 1990, it was able to display videos with a resolution of 156 by 116 pixels without hardware acceleration. So that was all done by the CPU. And later, when it was used on the web, it was able to do live stream of videos just using dial-up connections with 9,600 about. That's like 9,600 charts that get transmitted per second, which is basically the way I saw my first like rock concert online, which you couldn't say I really saw it because it was just a bunch of pixels moving around. But yeah, that was, I think, in 95. And that was like the golden age of Netscape, right? So video on the web did look a bit alien back then because it was not a native part of the web. It was always some foreign, some third-party software with its own Chrome that got rendered into the browser application. If anyone remembers the embed element, yeah, basically that was the thing. And yeah, later on in 1997, Macromedia released the Shockwave player. So in the meantime, we had different things like the real-time player or uh, many bunch of other stuff. But in 97, they released the, the Shockwave player. It wasn't meant for video playback back then. That wasn't a thing until 2002, when they shipped the first version that supported the Sorensen Spark video codec, which was loosely based on the H.263 spec, which then later was followed up by the H.264 and H.265 spec, which is what we use on a, for web video nowadays. And well, later on, the Shockwave player became the Flash player. Um, Macromedia got acquired by Adobe. And yeah, but before that, they were actually able to ship like a vi video codec which was optimized for low resolution video and especially small file sizes. Um, this is a demo video, original demo video from Shockwave from 2002, which is like the launch of a Soyuz spaceship or something like that. And this video had a duration of 43 seconds. It only, uh, uh, also included audio and it only took about 560 kilobytes of space. So with this technology, you were able to fit like two um, minutes of video on a floppy disk, which is, I, I mean, you don't want to watch a movie in that quality, but still, for back in the day, that was amazing. And yeah, it wasn't still not native to the browser. So you had to install some external software. And uh, if you were using Linux, you had to be very lucky for it to be working. And yeah, it, it wasn't really good. And another thing all those technologies had in common, they basically were uh, a black box. So some piece of alien software sitting on your web page like, like a parasite, like eating out all the good. And that was the truth until 
2007, when Opera came around and proposed a video tag. So that was the first time we saw native video on the web, which is still the thing that we use today to have like moving pictures on our web pages, right? So the video tag itself, I think it's, it's super easy. It's, it's really convenient. And this is like from the original spec, this, this example. It also had a fallback built in. So if you read it, like if you can't see the video for whatever reason, not proper codec installed, your browser can't like, cope with the video element, you can download the video and watch it in your favorite video player. But then the question comes up, what if I don't want like enable everyone to download the videos I'm putting out on the web? And well, let's do what developers do in such situ situations, ask Stack Overflow. So how do I prevent HTML5 video from being downloaded? This thread is like the most popular and there's some really like accessibility harming and user experience harming solutions like suppressing the right click of the mouse so that people can download it. Well, hello DevTools. And <laughs> yeah, the only, the only answer that, well, is technically correct, the best type of correct, is, well, you can't. You can make it harder to download videos when you embed them using the video tag, but we can't prevent people from downloading them. Which is kind of like a little whoops thingy, I, I guess, for like people or, well, companies like, let's say Netflix or Amazon or Hulu who want to have video on the web but don't want to enable people to download the thing. So our wonderful video element is basically the total opposite of the technologies we had before. It's like total opposite of a black box. Um, it makes it super easy to get to the source of what is requested. But yeah, so Netflix uses the video tag, so you might think like, okay, if, if you can't prevent like downloading videos and Netflix uses the video tag, can I just like right click and save Netflix? Of course you can't, like that doesn't work. And the reason for that is DRM. Digital rights management or digital restrictions management always depends like on the person you ask. So what is this DRM thingy and, and what does it do? Well, first of all, DRM is not a single technology. It's not like this piece of software. It's not like this piece of hardware does, that does a thing. It's more like an umbrella term for many different um, like technologies and many different things it stands for. For example, like authentication, uh, user-specific encryption, content-specific encryption, and all the key and licensing stuff, and very important things like forensics and traitor tracing. So if you have video pirates downloading video from one of the platforms and redistributing that, I don't know, via BitTorrent or whatever, you can trace it back. So theoretically, it's possible to trace it back even to the account, the, the person who ripped the video uh, was using like to download this video. But to understand DRM, it's not only like you don't, you can't just only understand the technologies behind that. You also have to understand like the whole ecosystem, so why it's there and who's involved. And so we need to take a look at the well ecosystem stakeholders, all the parties that are involved in getting DRM up. So for example, we have their content owners, like those are the companies who produce and own the content, like Disney, for example. We have DRM cores, those are the companies who provide technology to encrypt and decrypt or encode and decode those videos, like, I don't know, Google, Apple, Microsoft, and a bunch of others. We have service providers who make like server-side software to do the actual encryption and client-side software to do the decryption. We have uh, browsers and players who are there to play content. Doesn't need, necessarily need to be a browser, but a player, video player of some sort. We have content providers. Those are like Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, those type of companies who, um, well, nowadays they also produce their own content, but usually, especially in the earlier days, they just license them, the content from the actual content owners. And we also have device and chip vendors because DRM exists in software form, but also in hardware form. And all of these like companies who work in all of those spheres have a say in, in the DRM ecosystem. So they all have a, a voice, they have their own opinion, and they, 
they, well, have their own lobby for a couple of things. Different topic. Have you ever wondered, while you're at home and you started watching, for example, on Chrome, like a video on Netflix, and you thought like, well, this is like shitty quality, that's only SD. I mean, I have like this MacBook Pro X, I don't know what, and it's, it's only SD quality, so what is going on here? So you switch to your living room where you have your Apple TV or your Google whatever streaming thingy, and there it's like the same content, same network, same connection, same bandwidth, same account, and you can watch it in HD quality on your, on your TV. It's like, that, that doesn't make sense. Well, it does make sense to the content owners who license, give out the licenses to those um, to those movies and, and TV shows. Um, this is based on something called the trusted environment robustness, which is basically, the thing is, the more secure your player environment is, the better quality you're usually able to receive or to watch like the content in. Um, on the one side, you have just software decoding. This is the thing that usually happens when you use uh, Firefox or Chrome to watch videos on, on online platforms. It's purely based on a software library that gets downloaded transparently from Google's Edge servers in the background, um, the Vine library. And then you have like the next step, which is called the hardware-assisted hardware environment, which is something that the underlying OS must support, so to make it more secure. If you're using Mac OS X or iOS, then you're using the DRM technology provided by Apple that's baked into that operating system. Same goes if you're using Windows and using Edge as a browser, for example. It's using the DRM technology that's baked into the operating system, which is more secure. It's basically a system that doesn't allow third-party applications to access a certain part of secure memory. So everyone's logged out except for that one application that does the actual DRM decryption or the video decoding, maybe. And yeah, then you also have like the full hardware setup where you have DRM really on baked into processes on a chip basis, which is considered the most secure thing because you just can't tap into that chain. It comes, goes from one chip to basically the output of your, of your graphical system. And there it's totally fine to always ship like the premium content in 4K or whatever because that is like the most secure environment. Basically, they just want to like stop um, pirates from pirating videos or making it unattractive as possible where it is most likely because those software uh, client-based DRM systems, they have been hacked. Like quite recently, there was a new hack for the current Google system which basically enables you to get rid of the DRM, and this is all just a rule of thumb. So some content providers or some content owners, they're totally fine with, yeah, we'll ship 4K quality and software, de software um, client decoded environments because, well, we don't care, or the movie is that old that nobody cares. But in like rule of thumb is the, the more secure your playback environment is, the better is the quality you can play back. Yeah, talking about DRM cores and browsers. So which browser uses which DRM system? Apple uses their own system. They developed initially for the iPod for music streaming, um, which is called Fairplay. Microsoft using a system that's called PlayReady. So they had like this short-lived Silverlight thingy. And they were using a DRM system that was called Smooth Streaming. But they recently, when they abandoned Silverlight, the, te the technology, they developed a new system, which is baked into Windows. Um, and Chrome and Firefox use a technology that's called Videvine from a company of the same name, which is owned by Google. So congratulations if you moved away from uh, Chrome to Firefox because of the reason not, used, not to use any Google technology. You screwed up because... <laughs> What's, what's, what is really happening if you play back like on Netflix or Amazon Prime, like the first time you do start the video playback in Firefox, transparently in the background, Firefox down, downloads a two or three megabyte library from Google's Edge servers, the Videvine library, and that is used as the so-called CDM to decrypt and decode videos. We're going to focus on Videvine throughout the talk. So basically all of those systems, at least on an interface level, work the same. 
So yeah, I, I just mentioned the CDM thingy. So what's that? CDM stands for Content Decryption Module, which can be some piece of software, but also, also can be some piece of hardware. Um, can be used to only decrypt the videos. So take the DRMified video and just do the decryption, like all those security stuff, and let the video tag in the browser render the thing. But it also can be like more secure and not only do the decryption, but also the actual video decoding, like decoding the simple frames and pass that frames back to the browser so um, that the browser doesn't really is able to like, get hold on that stream of videos because it's pre-rendered. And with Firefox and Chrome, of course, this happens usually with the software library by Vine, which means the GPU is not involved. So if you render the video, you render usually just by using your CPU. And Videvine, as far as I figured out, because I have, there are no technical documents about it out there, as far as I figured out, it only uses uh, the maximum of two threads simultaneously. So if you have an eight core CPU, doesn't matter because only two of those cores are utilized by the system when doing the actual video decoding, which is bad if you have like, like low powered systems running on ARM processors or something like that. Okay, so far that was a bit abstract, yes. <laughs> um, how does this apply to the real world then? Let's take a look at Netflix. Let's take a look at the request the Netflix page is doing when you start starting the video playback, which is a bunch of requests. Yes, this is just like snapshot, like that's not even all of them. But after I, well, did work like we're stopping some resources from loading, etc. I finally figured out that to do the actual playback of the video, only those free, free requests are needed. So you need to have the manifest, you need to have a license for that content, and the uh, thing on the bottom is basically the first video chunk of the video you watch. So yeah, I mean, still cryptic though, I know, but to get a better understanding of it, let's turn that into actual JavaScript code. Let's code our own DRM, our own video player in JavaScript that uses DRM. Fair warning, so <laughs> we won't build like a whole Netflix player experience on the slides I show you because the last time I checked, the Netflix player consists of over 76,000 lines of JavaScript. A lot of edge cases in there. Um, but you should get the basic implementation details or ideas from it. That is the high level picture of what happens to be able to play back a video. Confusing at first, I know, but we'll go over it step by step. So we start with this boilerplate code. But okay, yeah, before we dig deeper into what each of those functions does, we need to get familiar with one more technology, EME, the so-called encrypted media extensions, which are browser API pretty dumb browser API because they're just an interface to the content decryption module, the CDM, to the key system, to the licensing server system, packaging services. It's a really like just an, just an interface. It doesn't do any decoding or decrypting um, itself. It's just like really an interface to the CDM, the technology behind. Okay, but let's start with implementing the video player. We start with a configuration and in that configuration, which is vendor dependent, we tell the backend system basically how secure our environment is, our trusted environment robustness, which kind of codecs we support, and yeah. So this then later on, of course, determines the quality of the content we're able to play back. Next thing we're going to take a look at is the initial media key system generation. That's like. In German, in German, we say it's a tongue breaker, if you say something like that. So this is the part where we're actually going to interact with the CDM, the content decryption module. We apply the config and we request access to the CDM library in the background. And once that is done, we need to reference the video element and we created those keys using the CDM system, like that black box thingy we are not in control of in the back. Um, that gives us back some media keys and we apply that to the video element we're going to use to play back the video. So key system is ready now. Um, then we need to get our DRM session going. For this we use something that's called like, on the media keys object create session 
which returns a new media key session object. It's basically the same thing as you are on a web page, a shop online, and well, have a session with your with your shopping cart. So every time this is, this has a one to one relation, and we need that to have a secure context for exchanging messages with the CDM system. So after that, we generate basically a request with another thing that was given by the CDM, which is called the init data, just some blob of binary data. And if you're wondering what C and C stands for, that I was wondering for a long time, that stands for common encryption, which, which is just some ISO standard, a, um, um, a protection scheme for uh, the video data itself. Part and bit here, event listener. So if that isn't worked, we know we're ready to retrieve the license from the server, which happens using just a plain old H, uh, HTTP request. Usually, you can use whatever you want because you're in control of that. But usually, it's just like a bit of binary data you get. Then this needs to apply it to the key session. And we're basically then ready to, after we've played back all of those things and played with all of this, this um, parties here in that system to play back video. So we haven't played a single second of video net. This was all basically the introduction of being able to play back video. In order to do that, we need to get familiar with yet another browser API, which is called MSE, Media Source Extensions. They, th this is totally unrelated to DRM itself because it's just a programmatic way to access the source attribute of the video element. So we can then use JavaScript to send any data we generate to the video element to have, it, to have a regular video output. And we do it like this. So this is ba basically using uh, MSE to um, shuffle data onto the video element. We need to, again, to tell it which codecs we're supporting, et cetera, et cetera. So this is not something I'm, I'm going into detail now. So OK, we're now able to load and play back video, but we're still missing a piece. Like, where do we, like how do we know which video chunks to load and which video chunks to play back then? This we get from the manifest. So the manifest, like this is this is basically a manifest request we we issue with Netflix. Again, we need to tell them, yeah, that's the that's the DRM system that we're using, Videvine. Those profiles basically determine the types of content we would like to play back. Like, do we support um, 5.1 audio? Which kind of video resolutions does our system want to support, etc.? So usually the manifest. There are different types of manifests out there. Usually, MPEG dash is used, which is an XML-based um, manifest. Netflix itself uses a JSON version of that, which is quite like an attribute vice compatible with the XML version. And one thing MPEG dash enables us, which is quite cool, is something called adaptive bitrate switching. This is the thing, like when you're going on a train, for example, and you're what, watching a video on your phone. You see, video playback doesn't stop. Even if your bandwidth goes down, it just gets like super low res, but it doesn't stop. And this is the thing that is known as adaptive bitrate switching, because the manifest basically tells us this is the resolutions we support, and this is the bandwidth that you should have to download this specific chunk. And if your bandwidth goes down, then the next chunk will be loaded with a lower resolution, which is quite like a nifty thing. And that completes our picture. So this is, this is all, these are all the things that we need to do when we want to play back deramified videos. But not if we are Netflix, because Netflix thought, well, this is still too insecure for us, and added something on top, which is called MSL, Message Security Layer, which is just something they encrypt their resources, like the manifest and the license and everything, with. Not going into detail of that. So Netflix itself put up a very good blog post in 2014 already describing that. If you want to see an open source implementation of all of this, you can go to my GitHub repo, because to my knowledge, this is the only open source Netflix client that's out there. So uh, it even supports low-powered ARM devices like the Raspberry Pi 2. So if you have one of those lying around, you can have proper Netflix playback, at least in SD quality, with those, uh, those low-powered machines. 
uh, using this repo. But yeah, back to the main topic. The thing is, we turned our precious video element back into some kind of black box. We added something we're not in control of again, like the CDM system that does all the heavy lifting for us, and then just patches that pushes some data onto the video element. Yeah. Let's ask Sir Tim Berners-Lee what he thinks about this. I mean, he's an advocate of the open web, and he says, so in summary, it is important to support EME encrypted media extensions as providing a relatively safe, relatively safe, online environment in which to watch a movie as well as the most convenient and one which makes it a part of the interconnected discourse of humanity. Okay, so Tim Berners-Lee, interesting statement. Of course, there are other voices, like for example, if you ask the Electronic Frontiers Foundation, which was a founding member of the W3C and left the W3C over the dispute of this technology being implemented into browsers and being standardized. So the EFF said, in 2013, EFF was disappointed to learn that the W3C had taken on the project of standardizing encrypted media extensions, an API whose sole function was to provide a first class role for DRM within the web browser ecosystem. So we'll keep fighting to keep the web free and open. We keep suing the US government to overturn the laws that make DRM so toxic, and we keep bringing that fight to the world legislators. That was in 2013. To be honest, nothing much has happened since then, unfortunately. But yeah, I'm not here to tell you what you should think about this whole topic and DRM. Uh, all I wanted to do was like shed some light onto the topic, at least how much is possible in 25 minutes. And yeah, if you have any questions, please reach out to me. And if you feel like you want to read more about this, I also have some resources that I'll tweet out later on about this. And yeah, with that, thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.